Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of Mirabilis Designs webinar on saving costs, reducing power, and eliminating excess capacity in data centers. I'm your host, Deepak Shankar, and the founder of Mirabilis Design. And today I will be talking about a new mechanism that can save you considerable amount of money, considerable amount of uh, capacity, and also be significantly more efficient in the deployment of your co-locations and data centers. Before we get started, a small practice on uh, logistics of the webinar. We have uh, an, uh, an uh, muted webinar, meaning there's only one person talking, that'll be myself. Now there is the uh, chat window that's available on your control panel, and you can type in your questions and there are people standing by to answer the questions. So once again, welcome to Mirabilis Design's webinar on data centers, saving costs, reducing power, and eliminating capacity. As I mentioned, I'm your host, Deepak Shankar, and I'm the founder of Mirabilis Design. Today, we're gonna start off by talking about an introduction to what are the data center requirements. You, if you go on the internet, you'll find a lot of articles, but what you'll be really missing is how can you, get those requirements? How can you do the planning in an efficient and in a measurably accurate manner? So as we go into that introduction of what that means to you, we're also going to do a case study where we're going to size the data center and estimate performance and power. The whole goal is to show you how you can very quickly create a tangible definition of your system, a tangible prototype of your system, and run a simulation to estimate what the performance would look like. That way you can have a very clear view of your design before you go off and, de and deploy the system. Finally, a little bit of an introduction to Mirabilis Design. So as to get started, we're gonna talk about this new approach to designing data centers. If you look at today's data centers, they start with the current or future service level agreement or SLA get what your current configuration and usage estimate from performance measurement tools. And then you uh, determine based on that, what your configuration should be. If you have more users, you simply add more servers. Now, if you don't have space, you try to figure out how you're gonna fit these new customers into the servers. But it's more of a process of patchwork. You know, I start off with something and then I just keep adding on. The, the lack of an ability right up front when you start your co-location or start your data center to plan for the future is very hard because there isn't a very dynamic and uh, accurate way to measure what would happen if say the traffic changes or workload changes or the customers change or SLA changes. And this is what we're gonna really discuss today. So if you look at the challenges that are faced with the current approach in designing the data centers, first and foremost is budget planning is extremely difficult because you only have, a, before you get started, you only have a limited visibility into the operating expense and also what is the system utilization because you're either using an analytical method like Excel spreadsheets or you're using, um, maybe a past experience to come up with what the architecture of the data center needs to be. The other thing is that you are making some you know, assumptions and based on that, making capital investments. These investments are extremely expensive. So it's not just the, the building structure or the security of the structure or the uh, closed circuit cameras, but really it's about the uh, electronics. It's about the software licenses, the inter-process communication, the storage, the interfaces to the internet, all of those aspects, and you're building all of those without having complete visibility into what would really happen for different workloads, for different traffic, for different user conditions, for, and as requirements go up, how does it all change? Which leads to scalability. Because scalability doesn't just mean adding more service, Scalability is about load distribution. If I add five more users, how do I continue to work without adding new servers or without adding a new interface? It's really about anticipating based on clearly defined 
metrics that you have used to design the architecture of the data center. Finally, missing out on a lot of revenue opportunity. Once you put all the servers in place, you have no more flow space, which means you can't put additional servers, which means that uh, what you'll end up doing is either you'll build a new data center or you will try to you know, live with what you already have, which means that you're gonna miss out on a lot of opportunities that could be done if you had uh, you know, analyzed it upfront to understand how we could allocate the different servers, virtual machines, operating systems, storage across these different requirements that are gonna come along. So what we're proposing is to evaluate the data center hardware and software before you go off and build the product or with a product in this case being the co-location or data center. We start off with three different templates. We have the communication template, which is all the inter-process communication, the interfaces, the connectivity between storage and the compute servers, uh, the communication between the hardware and software, all of those attributes. Then we have the compute or the computation templates and finally how we schedule it. Now, we tend to overlook the scheduling, but in reality, the scheduling is probably one of the most important elements because it handles all your load distribution, handles how you can be economically more efficient, handles the power consumption, because if I shut down a whole bunch of servers, I'm gonna get so much more additional uh, you know, uh, savings on my cost and on my operational expenses. So what are, the, what are the possibilities when I have these three? I can create an architecture that looks something like this. So I've got a bunch of these security devices, signal processing systems, uh, processors, all of these, and I can you know, schedule each one independently. That means each one has its own scheduling algorithm. Another way to look at the same architecture is to you know, like create a single static scheduling and handle all the workloads. So my AI, GPUs, microprocessors, micro engines, all of those, how do they all get scheduled, right? Now, which one's better for architecture? It all depends on your workload, your traffic and your cost efficiency, which is amounts to your SLA. Now, migrating to a reliable and accurate method of data center design is not just you know, like moving away from an Excel spreadsheet and trying to do a more elaborate study, but really it's migrating from the theoretical and analytical studies into more of a dynamic or a discrete event stimulation. So you're looking at your network topologies, uh, the traffic distribution, scalability, load balance, hardware, license, software licenses, all of those. The important thing to remember here is there's a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, activities that are around the network, which means that, you know, how is my network connectivity, either the inter-process communication or the internet interfaces, how do they all work together? That is really where most of the effort goes into, but that is not where the biggest cost is. If you look at most data centers, your interfaces at the peak are only about 30 to 40% utilized and on the average, three to 4% utilized. That's not where the problem is. The problem is inside the data center, which is your servers, the storage, the software licenses, the virtual machines, all of those attributes. So when you simulate, you're creating really a graphical prototype of the data center or the co-location site. And then you set up attributes for each one of these individual. How many data centers do I need? How many uh, interfaces do I require? What are, how many processors? What should be, how many cores? What should be the clock speed? What should be the memory? How much should be the storage? Do I go with SSD or do I go with hard drives? Being able to study all of these, the attributes for each one of those through measured statistics and reports that are generated out of this dynamic simulation will allow me to size these systems such that I both meet the service level agreement or SLA and be profitable. The goal is to meet the highest level of efficiency. So you're really optimizing for that efficiency. Now, 
to try to understand the concept of how you do system modeling, if you have taken an example of a server, a server typically consists of multiple processors, it has some sort of an interface or IO, has a bus structure inside, PCI Express, Ethernet, any of the standard technologies, may have a accelerator like for artificial intelligence or DSP or signal processing or a graphic processor, any of those kind of things. So that's your hardware setup. On top of that, you have the application. So in this case, we have one application that's made up of task one, task two, task three, and task four. So what happens through my system? What I would typically do that say task one runs on uh, CPU, task two runs on IO. So I'm going to say task one takes 30 cycles. So that's about 2% utilization. But that's not really accurate because what can happen is while task four is executing here, task one could be feeding here and becoming available in the CPU one. So the workload, the data that you're feeding in has a huge impact on that utilization. So just to give you an idea, if I just take a single transaction going through, you can see what the flow is. You start with the IO, go to the CPU, go to the DSP, come back to the IO and go out. Now, think about it, this is for one request. Now there's like millions of requests coming in, sometimes billions of requests coming in, and they're all coming in at different rates or different distributions, and they're all going to be on top of each other, meaning they could become in a, like a bunched up manner or highly uh, you know, separated out or in a normal distribution or Poisson distribution. The important thing is to understand here is where are all the contention for the resources? You know, where am I going to suffer if I do not do a good job in designing this architecture? Uh, a simple question always be, oh, let's reduce buffering. Yeah, but where is my buffering? Is it on the, uh, is the buffering on the network or is the buffering on the processor? How do I figure that out? That is where what you do is not just run a single application, but you start running multiple applications. There's another application too, which has its own set of tasks. And now you can see how that one starts operating. And what you're gonna notice here is that it's got its own configuration and its own data movement across this network of what we call the server farm. And uh, when I combine these multiple applications and then I combine you know, a certain set of hardware platforms, I have to scale it because today what you're looking at here is only a single server. But now in reality, I'm gonna have lots of devices connected, a whole network hub, and then of course the data center, which has got a large number of servers, software, uh, virtual machines, operating systems, interfaces, storage, all of those kind of things. There has been some questions, so I'm gonna you know, just look through that and uh, you know, answer some of those as they come along. Yes, we will be sharing the presentation at the end of this uh, session um, and an email will be sent to you with the information. Now, what are the types of reports? See, one of the things that's hardest to calculate in any data center design or any other system design is really the power consumption. So before I actually deploy, I need to know what's my peak usage of power? What's my average usage? What is the power for each device? And the reason that's important is because the cooling cost is a significant part of my, uh, of my cost, of my capital, of my operating expenses. So generating those kind of reports. But in addition to that, you want to see what is the efficiency. You know, how many MIPS, which is the millions of instructions per second, am I getting out of these processors? What is the uh, latency that from the time it enters the data center or from my IoT data center going through all the processing coming out or from say an automotive uh, system, like say a car, making an autonomous driving decision, what's gonna be the, the response time to determine, do I slow down, do I break, do I make, take a turn? What are the things that I have to do? So the reports really help you make those decisions. Now, now that you've seen a little bit about the concept, what's the advantage with data center modeling? The biggest advantage with data center modeling is you get valuable insight into the operation before you actually deploy. 
So before you deploy, you already know what's going to happen in your system. So you know, is this going to be efficient for this type of a workload? Uh, you know, what's going to be my cost, not just my uh, electricity cost, but also cost in terms of, you know, the complexity adds to the number of staff I need, or in terms of, you know, the training the staff, or if there's a downtime, the response to getting it back up and running, all have a huge impact from the system design itself. And of course, you know, for this kind of a data center, what's my bill of materials? That's going to become my capital expenses. Now, that's for the insight. The second thing is projection for investment, both now and the future. Now, today, the thing was you, you do analytical models or maybe you do a network simulation to figure out what's going to be the requirement. But really, what you need is an accurate measurement for variety of configurations. Because when you take an analytical model, you will do it as a flat design, meaning that you know, you'll say, hey, I'm going to get data in a Poisson distribution, which is how the internet works. You get data in a Poisson distribution and there's traffic that is generated at you know, these time ranges and there's the amount of traffic that's generated and things like that. But it doesn't happen that way because there's a lots of Poisson distribution that are overlaid on top of each other. So you do not want to really look at the, uh, you know, look at just one distribution or just a multiplier one distribution, but it's based on overlaying all these Poisson distributions on top of each other, which gives you a better projection on what your investment is going to be and what's going to be a return on investment, which is your SLA quality. So in a sense, you have the ability to offer a higher SLA than what your competition is offering, for example, or maybe a higher SLA over what your requirements are. Now, simplifying system complexity. See, one of the things is just adding another server, putting another VM, you know, operating system. Those, you know, you can just keep scaling it that way. But the problem is the complexity goes off because if something happens, you got to find out which servers. And I got these thousand servers as opposed to, I only need 300 servers. So a huge amount of uh, advantage. Now, to be really simplified, the load balance, the scheduling becomes very, very important. The other aspect is what we call worldview. You may have multiple data centers distributed across the world. So how do we distribute the traffic across all of them, either based on distance from the uh, server or based on governmental contracts, dynamic usage, response time. There's so many different attributes that you want to take to determine you know, how to, you know, where to send the traffic based on uh, all these requirements. The last one, and which if you look on the web, you'll never see this one being discussed, which is managing your software license, especially for people that have their own dedicated servers. What should, what should be the number of licenses that need to be allocated. How many licenses do I need of each of the software? How many VMs do I need? Being able to understand it. And that requires, you know, how many jobs am I gonna get? You know, how, what is gonna be the schedule of these jobs? You know, what is the frequency at which these jobs are gonna come? Are there any dependency software? Um, what is gonna be the types of hardware that's required for each of these jobs? So that will help me understand how I'm gonna manage these software licenses. Now, there are some key terms in system modeling, and I'm going to you know, walk you through some of the key terms before we get into the case study. Architecture optimization or exploration is really the key term that's used in the data center modeling and system modeling environment, where what you're trying to do is you're creating a model of your system and you're uh, defining attributes of the system, so processor, speed, topology, arbitration, things like that, and you set up your requirements. You know, this is what my latency should be. This is what my power consumption, cost, weight, things like that. Then you run what's called a performance analysis, which tells you, you know, where your buffering is, how much of buffering is happening, what's your throughput, what's your response time. The other aspect is really running the power, which is a you know, major part of your operational cost, which is you know, like, uh, what is the power for a particular workload? or what's the power for having this many servers, or what is the workload based on your software uh, setup. All of those kind of things are important and key attributes. 
Right? Now, apart from that, there's also a concept called functional correctness, which is if I have a task graph that defines what is gonna happen in my system, you, you wanna make sure that it's, you can trace it to, it's to, to ensure that it's working correctly. Same thing with failures. You know, if there's failures, does my system continue to operate? Can I still maintain my SLA? Now, we saw the sizing of the data center of, the, of today. Here's the sizing of the data center of the future. You start with the current and future SLA. You create a model, a data center model of all your servers, storage, software, interfaces, operating systems, and everything. And then you simulate the requirements of the future to optimize for latency, throughput, energy, uh, and any other type of quality of service attributes. Now, here's the key thing. It's not a one-time process. It's something that you start off with, but as you keep getting feedback on, hey, here's the profile of our traffic is changing, or here's the application changing, or here's some additional things I need to add for security, you keep rerunning the simulation to figure out how does the system actually behave? You know, how do, how do you optimize for, you know, for all of these different uh, SLA or your requirement attributes? Once you do that, it becomes a continuous process of optimizing my data center. Now, we're gonna walk you through one use case to help you understand how this can be done in, for your environment. The modeling of the data center architecture, the methodology works as follows. You start off with determining where you think you want your SLAs to be, meaning you know, how much do you want to offer in terms of response time or number of users that can access or you know, the, uh, you know, the throughput that you want to offer or how many uh, requests can be handled per hour. Uh, you know, what is your uptime? What is the power consumption? Which means you know, your operational pricing, all of those. You create that and put that as a goal input for your model. Then you construct an architecture model. So you include the communication aspect, you include hardware, the software, the licenses, the inter-process communication. And so you start putting all of those together in the form of a system model. Now, once you created the model and you say, okay, here's all my attributes, here's all the parameters for each one of these, here's all the variables I'm gonna modify, the next step is to add the workload and traffic. Workload is typically a task graph, which says when this tra traffic comes in or this type of request comes in, this is the sequence it goes through. If this request comes in, this is a different type. So essentially allows you to describe different types of workloads based on your user type, based on the application, based on uh, the, uh, the, uh, you know, the requirements for handling that particular uh, request. Once you put all of these together, once you've defined your inputs and your attributes, you run simulations of these systems and then you view the reports. So you're, you're gonna look at the metrics against these goals. So remember you had the SLA goals. So when you get these reports out, you wanna see, you know, does my SLA match my goals? Have, I'm sorry, does my metrics, output metrics match my goals? Have I been able to achieve what I'm looking for? No, it's an iterative process. So it goes back and forth to say, okay, let me modify certain attributes of the system. Maybe the topology, maybe the number of servers, maybe the number of processes, manage those and run it again and see, oh yeah, this can happen. Then start looking at what happens if I get an overload, a sudden uh, you know, deluge of traffic or a few servers fail, or we'll say one of the inter interfaces fails. What is gonna happen? Can I still maintain that SLA? So you start planning, not just for your good case, but also for your bad or your failure cases as well. That's how modeling and simulation of data center architecture works. So if you look at data center block diagram, you can see we have lots of requests on the left-hand side, lots of interfaces, and they could be hundreds of interfaces. You have the task lookup, and then you describe your uh, details of what is inside the data center. So it can be operating systems, uh, virtual machines, processor cores, uh, storage, any of those kind of attributes. A task lookup is essentially your application. 
Now, then you describe your parameters or your attributes. Now, one of the things we tend to do is use uh, a lot of trace input from Bioshark. Now for uh, applications that don't exist or for new designs, uh, we have mechanisms to generate what's called traffic to simulate those activities or those packets that are coming in on the interfaces. And of course, you can, you can have variety of attributes. These are just a sampling of few of them, uh, like looking at the interfaces, the processors, the operating systems, and the storage. But you could have hundreds of other attributes that you could select from to make your decisions. Now, a model in Visual Sim is constructed using these colorful blocks in the environment. So you, as you saw, see at the bottom, those are the task graphs. And the task graphs are describing for different types of requests, what should be the sequence of events that occur in the data center. And of course you have the interfaces, you have the data center. And then of course, we have a concept called a hierarchical system. So if you notice over here, comes in from the interface, sends it up to the OS, hypervisor, processor core, and then the storage associated with the processor core. Now notice here, the connectivity between all of them is virtual, very similar to the virtual approach in a data center. So it's very easy for us to reconfigure different processes or different approaches. We call that process mapping of behavior to architecture, uh, very similar to, you know, like separating out the hardware from the software or the application from the operating system, things that, that the virtual machine does today. So you create these and then you set up any of your details of your data center, which is you know, all the different uh, attributes of your data center. Uh, the request typically, as I mentioned, is traffic generation or Wireshark type data. And then of course you have your power. So you notice that the power has gotten a pretty large block because it's a pretty significant part of the simulation or the part of the design. So what do I get? You know, I just start off with an initial values. I don't have a lot of data. So I say, I'm gonna start off with something simple. I put the, put the topology and I set up certain attributes and I run the simulation. Notice first and right off the bat is the latency, which is the time it takes for a request to get a response back is constantly increasing. So this tells me that the resources are just not sufficient to handle the workload. Now, if you look at this, you will see that all the interfaces are heavily overloaded. So there is no real space. So most likely there's a lot of buffering. So what do we do? We change some topologies, like we change the number of processes. We move uh, some of the data from one data center to another data center, uh, increase the number of interfaces. And we try more experiments. So here, for example, we're going from 13 to 22 channels versus 23 to 22 channels. You can see what the latencies are for those tasks. You know, what is the throughput I get at the end point? And of course the latency. So unlike the previous case, notice here our end-to-end -end latency is in a much more manageable range. Of course, notice there are these regular spikes. What these are indicating is these spikes indicate that there is some burst of traffic happening. So most of the time it's on the lower level right over here, but you see different types of bursts arrive and you can see, so for example, most of my latency is about uh, 0.4 microseconds within the data center, but I can actually go up to almost 2.6 to 2.7 microseconds. So we're looking at almost uh, a six to seven X difference in the latency. If you had done an analytical model, you would have been somewhere either very, very high over here, which means you're over-designed, or you'd be right down here, which is more closer to the average. But here you can see exactly what's gonna happen because we're simulating the exact representation, exact behavior of what your design is doing. So as you can see, uh, the, uh, the, data struct, the data center model has a lot of details. A lot of information is built in. And you might say, oh my God, it's gonna take a huge amount of effort to put it. Not really. The reason is we provide a large number of library blocks and templates that allow you to drag and drop them and assemble up a full application setup. So it essentially is allowing me to create this large library of components through which I can drag and drop 
and create different data center configurations. So a design could be put together in a matter of a week or so to get you up and running very quickly to understand how my data center is gonna operate. Quick introduction to Mirbless Design. We've been around for a while and uh, we provide um, system design services and software for data centers, electronics, semiconductors, and a whole variety of application spaces. Visual Sim is the name of the product. And we're based in Sunnyvale, California, but we do have development centers across the world. So we can support our customers in all these locations. Now, really one of the key things is this is the first platform for rapid prototyping of data centers. So until today, you had network modeling of data centers, but never looking at the entire end-to-end -end attributes of data center. That's what our solution is offering. Now, VisualSim itself allows you to model the hardware, the software, and the network. This is what makes it unique. And this is also what allows you to get very comfortable because you get extremely high accuracy in when you run your Monte Carlo simulations. Models, as we mentioned, are constructed using these predefined parameters libraries. A key aspect of the visual sim environment, as you saw, is completely graphical. So it's good for presentation, good for collaborative design, good for exploration and studies. And of course, not only can you run the simulation through graphical mode, we provide you the mechanism to distribute your uh, simulations across a large simulation platform. The reason for doing that is because you wanna try a variety of permutations and combinations, either for the traffic, for the workload, for the task graph, for the hardware software configurations, for all of those. So it allows you to very quickly run a huge uh, test case or a num large number of test cases. Mirrorless Design offers, as I mentioned, software and solutions. So we can provide you the software, train you, and get you up and running. Or we can provide services to help you, uh, you know, construct the, uh, the development as well. So it's, uh, it's a complete package for you to get up and running very quickly and be able to do your analysis. Not just a one-time thing, but on an ongoing basis as you keep adding new customers or your SLA changes or your workload changes or other attributes change. With this, I'd like to wrap up the webinar and I hope it was informative and you received the information that you are looking for. We're open now to answer any questions.